Hello everyone and welcome back to another instalment of the Warwick F1 show. It has been a few days since we witnessed the penultimate race of the 2024 season, the Qatar Grand Prix, which saw Verstappen with another win under his belt. This is now his first dry win since round 10 in Spain, what ultimately seems like a lifetime ago. Showing that ultimately, even though the Drivers' Championship is wrapped up, he is still not slowing anytime soon. However, this was not the main talking point from the race, the main talking point being the controversy surrounding Norris's penalty in the main race on the Sunday. On lap 30, after Albon lost him a debris on the main straight, there were double, double waved yellows on the straight, which Norris failed to slow down with, and this meant that he was met with a 10 second stop go penalty, the first time that we've seen such a penalty in over three years. Now, because of this points deficit from McLaren, it means that Ferrari are still in contention of winning the Constructors' Championship in Abu Dhabi. They are now just 21 points behind. And finally, it was another stellar performance from Pierre Gasly. The Frenchman finished P5 in his Alpine, which means that Alpine now sit five points ahead of their Constructors' rivals Haas for the battle for sixth, which means that they are looking more and more likely to secure that for the 2024 season. We shall be talking about all of this and more on today's episode. I'm your host, Callum J. Hodge, and we have got a very packed crowd with us uh, for today's episode. I'm once again joined by Catch, returning guests Oscar and Anwar, and finally, Chimmate as well. Now, uh, can I pass over to you, Chimay, if you're going to give us our race rundown, rundown. Uh, race rundown indeed. Yes. Go for it, Chimay. So, obviously, Verstappen taking over, uh, the taking victory uh, after a uh, sort of in penalty from qualifying, demoting him from pole to second place, followed by Charles Leclerc in a respectable second for Ferrari, helping, um, helping Ferrari's chances in the Constructors' battle going to the final round of the season. Uh, Oscar Piastri rounding up the podium places and Herrick um, after only finishing eight tenths behind. Then we've got George Russell who started the race on pole position and finished in fourth place, followed by a fantastic fifth place result for Pierre Gasly, who's having a who is having a fantastic run of results uh, and form at the end, towards the end of the season. Um, yeah, Carlos Sainz running. Uh, uh, the second of the Ferraris in sixth place, followed by Fernando Alonso in Aston Martin, first uh, Martin in seventh place. Uh, I guess the the uh, everyone's favorite result, Joe Guan Yu finishing in the points for Kick Salva, uh, finishing eighth place. Uh, so finally opening uh, the account for uh, for Salva, um, followed by Kevin Magnussen uh, who in ninth place. Lando Norris uh, running at the points after recovering from the stop goal penalty uh, uh, ran to only get to grab a single point, followed by Rati Podtas, who just missed out uh, a double Alpine, uh, not, not Alpine, uh, Salva points finish in 11th. Uh, Lewis Hamilton looking rather dejected after a, let's just say, very unlucky run of form uh, 12th place. Uh, Yuki Sonoda and Liam Lawson, the two RBs, and 13 and 14 respectively, followed by um, Alex Albon in 15th place. Uh, we have five DNFs with Hulkenberg, Perez, Stroll, Colapinto, and Esteban Ocon, as we will probably delve into uh, in rest of the Thank you very much, Jimmy. Yeah, we should also mention that Lando Norris was able to recover another point after getting the fastest lap, uh, but still obviously a points deficit for him compared to where he was. We'll be talking about some of those drivers that had rather eventful races, but first off, we should mention Verstappen. Obviously, a great performance from him once again to get like solidly now. It seems like he's getting back to his winning ways. Um, but the, the main thing I want to talk about for Verstappen is there was an incident that happened in qualifying, which meant that he received a grid drop penalty for the main race, meaning Russell started in first and Verstappen started in second. And this was slightly controversial before we get into even more controversial moments later on on the Sunday race, because it was claimed by Russell that Verstappen was blocking him in qualifying. However, both were on slow runs. There wasn't one that was on a fast run. And so many people had problems with this on either end. Russell couldn't seem, Russell obviously wanted the penalty and did get it for Verstappen. Verstappen couldn't un seem to understand why. And now we have even more controversy and beef between between two drivers, this time being Russell and Verstappen. Uh, and what, I'd like to come to you first to get your thoughts on this. What did you think on the incident? And do you think that the FIA got it right this time? I don't see the point of the penalty, to be honest. If they're both on slow laps, no one's exactly being harmed. 
Um, it's just a bit of a strange decision in my head. I get that if it was one person on a fast lap, it makes sense for there to be a penalty because you've it affected their performance. But off, it's, off the back of two slow laps, it's a very strange decision in my head. Yeah, no, I fully agree. And I am, you know, obviously, we are, obviously, if you if you watch Formula One and you have not been living under a rock for the last few days. One of the biggest comments was Verstappen lashing out in an interview saying he's lost all respect for Russell. Oh, I mean, okay, I know Verstappen's not had the most stellar reputation with being clean, but I feel that the fact that they were both on slow laps and Russell literally went to the stewards and complained with, if the rumours are true, the way he complained and the nature of it as well, it's just incredibly petty. Yeah, but I think... I, I'm not sure who... I, I think the main blame should ultimately... If the FIA have got the wrong decision, then surely the blame yeah. rests on the FIA. I mean, ultimately, you can't blame these drivers for trying to get every single point or every single advantage that they possibly can. I mean, at the end of the day, it's in their nature to try and do so. I think the blame personally has to rest on the FIA for making a wrong decision. And I do think it is the wrong decision because, as we mentioned, both were on slow laps. So there's no right for George Russell to have that racing line, ultimately. It is interesting. I think they they did just get it wrong. Sure, I completely agree with all the points that George wanted to get that extra advantage. He wanted to get ahead at the start. But a one pl- one place... That's a bit crazy. Like, have we ever seen that before? I think this was just really the start of a weekend of inconsistency for the FIA, and I think we really should have seen it coming. This is a foreshadowing. Yeah, certainly. It was It was not a good run from the FIA, and it was going to continue for the worst, I think, for the Sunday race. But before we get on to some other FIA antics from the weekend, I'd like to talk about McLaren and their antics at the end of the sprint. So Norris was leaving, <laughs> not, not, maybe, maybe not antics, maybe not antics, but Norris was leading the race for uh, the sprint race for, for the large majority of it. And then he made the decision on the final corner, just after the final corner, to hand it over the win over to his teammate, Piastri, who was in second, which I think was a very good thing to do because this has come. What race has this come from when Piastri let Norris through? It was Brazil. Brazil, yes. It was, a, it was a moment that everyone loved that moment, genuinely. So even the team, apparently only Oscar and Lando talked about it beforehand. The team had no idea. And the team was saying to Lando, hold position, hold position. Can we point out, he had such a good drive that sprint race. Sure, it's only a sprint, but he was giving. Like, Russell was on Piastri's back the whole race. Lando was slowing down to give Piastri DRS and just make sure they got that one-two finish in the sprint because all those points do matter for the constructors. And no one could accuse Lando of not being a team player anymore, in my opinion, because he let Piastri have that win. It didn't matter who came first, who came second. Um, It was just very clever. It was very nice. So, and I think it gave a sense of hope for... Because everyone went into Qatar. All of us expected McLaren to be very dominant. They weren't that dominant, to be honest. But at least during the sprint, they got they showed glimpses. And Norris especially showed glimpses of that pace that we all expected from that McLaren car. I, I was very happy to see Norris do that at the end of the day, I think. And because we have had a couple of moments this season where maybe their friendship and their relationship as, as driver pairings, and also just, just off the grid as well, has maybe been called into question, namely the instance at Monza. But I think that is really a good, solid foundation to carry into the last... That really cements a nice, solid foundation between them to continue into the last race of the season and continue into 2025 because they are going to be sticking around uh, as driver pairings, hopefully, for, for the foreseeable future if both drivers get on as well as they did. Uh, but now we'll go on to the main talking point for McLaren, which is Norris's penalty. Now, a lot of people had problems with this after the race because they thought it was too harsh. Just to give a reminder, there were double wave yellows on the straight because of some debris that was broken off of Alex Albon's car on lap 30. Double wave yellows, which Norris failed to slow down for, and for this he was handed a 10-second stop-go penalty. This dropped him to dead last in the race, minus obviously the, the cars that had DNF'd already, and this meant that he could only he only claimed two points in the end, even though I think it was, we should point out, it was a stellar comeback drive with not a lot of time left in the race, but the reality is it did happen very late on, and that's the other thing as well. The decision was very late in the race because 
ultimately the, the incident happened just after lap 30, I think, or, or a few laps afterwards. But it wasn't until around 10 laps to go, I want to say, something like that, that Norris actually got given the penalty, which seems at a very oddly long time for the FIA to begin the investigations, uh, or the stewards, sorry, to begin investigations into this incident. So, yeah, I want to ask what people's thoughts are on this. And well, we'll come to you first. What, what exactly was your take on this? So my opinion on the penalty is that it was applied way too late, firstly. You can't have a 30-second penalty and then apply it so late in the race where Norris doesn't exactly have the opportunity to make it back up. I think that's very harsh. I think the fact that it took 10 laps is crazy. Like, this type of thing should be a slam dunk type of situation. Historically, it's an accurate penalty in the sense that this type of thing has happened before and they've applied the exact same thing. Do I think, compared to all the other things that happened in that race, it is of the same severity? Or of a severity that warranted a bigger penalty? No. I felt taking out a person or speeding in the pit lane is categorically a lot worse than those penalties were representing. And if I compare what Norris has got now to him like starting the like going for a second formation lap in Brazil, where it's a very similar situation in the sense that it's a very dangerous type of thing to have. And he wasn't punished at all for that. I think that's very harsh. I think it's a very, that's very, another poor decision from the FIA. Yeah, I, I kind of, kind of sort of agree with what you're saying. Like, no one's under like any, like any delusions that Lando didn't break the rules in that scenario. But at the same time, I think it's, I think it's important that if, if the FIA had to come out after the race and be like, yeah, we're going to organise a press conference to basically walk through the decisions you've made. You realise something's something's maybe not yeah. completely right, and that's kind of my main gripe with this weekend is, obviously, I think a lot of the pun- penalties were punished, but it seems like they're increasingly relying on drivers to call them out. So, for example, Lando called out Lewis speeding in the pits. Max called out uh, Lando uh, going down the straight uh, and not slowing for the yellow flags. And you kind of have to question what is what is going on up in the FIA tower for them not to be able to spot these things at the moment. But, but also we should mention that it's not like this incident was spotted late. We knew about it pretty much almost it immediately after it had happened. You mentioned, obviously, and well, correctly, that it was Verstappen that pointed it out. And the commentators did say it about, about mid-30 or so laps. And we were still just waiting in the dark for about 10 laps before an actual incident was called out. And... That does seem that does seem very ridiculous ultimately, and I think we want to mention also the consistency of the decisions because you mentioned that it is a consistent decision, and you're obviously referring to I think it was in 2021 in the Austrian Grand Prix. I want to say there was uh, two drivers, uh, Nikita Mazepin and also Latifi, who got a stop go penalty for not slowing down under yellow flags, and so that's fine. But then. Should we be questioning how severe the penalty is in the first place for an incident like that? Because I think I completely agree with you, Anwar, that an incident like causing a collision or driving through the pit lane when it should be closed, that's a lot. That's a, an incident which has a lot more danger to the people working on the track, either the drivers or, or the people working in the pit lane, for example. And so that should be punished more severely. But it wasn't the case. So... Yeah, what what do we think? What penalty do you think should be given in instance like this? Essentially, what do we think that would be fair to Norris? I would say it should have been twenty seconds. I think twenty seconds makes sense, even though I believe it was still a technical fault. With the, we all saw the flags flicker on and off, on and off. Right. So for reference, I don't think that was. I don't think okay. Not the yeah. same incident in the sense that that was an issue on the t- on our broadcast graphics rather than on the track, from my understanding. Okay. And also, I think the other thing is the broadcast didn't show or exactly do a good job in showing wh- where this penalty was. Oh, no, I looked at it afterwards. Dark. Don't worry. I did yeah. just rely on the broadcast. But I think it should have been 20 seconds because even though... So with double-waved yellows, they are there for a reason. Sure, this time it was maybe unnecessary to have double-waved yellows, but there were double-waved yellows. They're there for a reason. So if you ignore them, it warrants a penalty. Sure. 20 seconds, that's fine. But the inconsistency through... For me personally, it's the inconsistency throughout the race. That was the issue with this situation, and that's what's made me so fuming about the whole situation. Sure, I kind of agree with Callum's point that it is too harsh of a penalty in the first place. But, and again, I'm aware of the point that it's consistent with what it should be, but 
20 seconds, let's leave it at that. But the FIA can't just go back to keeping up the rule book suddenly in two races from the end of the season. That's stupid. It's, I think, yeah, it's more the severity of the penalty that should be changed rather than the FIA's consistency, which is a bit different from what we've been talking about the FIA for consistency. Okay, that's a new point. I think the FIA's consistency is so horrendous. Oh, no, this what, that's what I mean. We've been talking about the FIA's... I think this is an issue of consistency, though. No, I think no, this is, but this is the difference. Okay, well, fair, fair enough. Yeah, but we, we've been talking about the FIA's consistency a lot this season with, with from, from instance with races like, like Austin and... So it makes a change that maybe we're not talking, we're just talking about the actual decision and the severity of the penalty. We'll go further into what was uh, the other main point that we had complaints of, I think, for a lot, a lot of people watching the race with the, with the FIA. And that's, why did they not call out a safety car from Albon's incident? Because the incident, the, the, the debris was on the track a, a good five laps before ultimately Sainz and Hamilton got that penalty. And they got punches. And they got punches. No, they no, both no, not got... the penalty, the punches. Sorry, know. sorry, the punches. Yeah, sorry, my bad. Um, and, and and both of their races were severely impacted by that incident, which ultimately should have been immediately identified by the FIA. So surely you've got to question what was the decision? Why, why was there no decision to bring out a safety car? Uh, I'm, as, as you said, I'm unsure as you are. I mean... They just seemed to do whatever they fancied any moment. Uh, my particular gripe with the weekend was uh, when they gave Stroll a penalty for something that he probably shouldn't have got one for. But I think ultimately, may- maybe if we're trying to get in the heads of the FIAs, maybe the safety car was was not called out because maybe they didn't. Maybe they thought they could they could solve it. Maybe they thought that um, a steward could get onto the track and get to it because it's such a small part. And at the time before. Uh, I think it was one of the Saubers, if my memory... It was. It was yeah. Bottas. The, yeah. So, obviously, we've mentioned it happened lap 30, Albon's mirror came off. I think it was probably around lap 34 that Bottas ran over it and shattered it. Yeah, lap 34. Yeah. And then soon and then after that, Hamilton sights. Yeah. yeah. So, and lap 35 is when the safety car was out. So, the FIA were forced to put out an explanation for all the instances that happened because everyone was criticising them. And their argument was that it is not, to quote, quote unquote, like directly quote the FIA, not normal practice to put a safety car out for small debris off the racing line. My first criticism of that point, it was directly next to the racing line. What are you doing? This is literally the only overtaking point on a track. Come on, it's really not hard to do a virtual safety car or something. Sure. But But then their next point was that, yeah. Quote unquote, a virtual safety car would not have been a solution as the cars remain spread out and there is not sufficient time for a marshal to clear the debris. That I agree with. I can agree with that, sure, but it's still, you need to clear the debris before it gets worse. It got to a point where they had to drive through the pit lane, the safety car out, was out for a bit. You can't s- anticipate the fact that someone is going, there's still, this happened at 30, it's a 57 lap race. You think that no one's going to hit that mirror on the main straight? For 27 laps, are you joking? Especially as, especially as we mentioned as well, that it was the main overtaking point really on the track. All you need is someone to pull out uh, after after getting a slipstream down the main straight and, and they were going to get punctures. And inevitably it did. So I think serious questions do have to be asked on the FIA's judgment on that decision personally. And ultimately it was really harsh for, for Sainz and Hamilton. They both had to had to pit afterwards to, to get new tyres, obviously after the puncture. And... I think we'll move on to Hamilton now because it, it was really a disappointing race for Hamilton. Uh, he h- had not had the best luck, I think, all weekend, and it was it was very disappointing to him. Even getting to the point where on lap forty eight he was asking to retire the car, which I think for for me it's just so sad to see that happening. That he's had such a bad run of form and he's lost so much faith in maybe not even the car, but maybe just himself. The he, he feels like he can't do any more and, and he doesn't even want to be in that car for the entire race. Was that the approach? I don't know. It, it's, you've got a feel for Hamilton in that scenario, surely. I think maybe it's like, you know, I'm, he's kind, obviously he's kind of coming to the end of the whole Mercedes thing now. But yeah, it definitely seems like he's a bit deflated almost or like defeated on that kind of thing, which I think society Hamilton, unfortunately, we've been seeing a lot more over the past few years is that he's not been able to compete up up towards the top um obviously he had some great races this year silverstone particularly sticks out in my mind 
but at the same time it's becoming that it's just moments and ultimately i think he's he's very much looking forward to being done with mercedes now as much as you know he'll probably be quite sad about leaving them next week uh he'll probably cry in the car and whatever but he, he, I think he's, I think he's almost ready to be done with all this Mercedes stuff that's going on, and just get going into a new team and try and go for that eighth at Ferrari. I think the other thing is he's probably now getting excluded from a lot of the meetings in regards to development of the car and stuff like that. So that might also be exacerbating the problem. I'm just just kind of sad that this whole legacy he's had is ending this way. In terms of his stint at Merck, it's been massively successful. These last th- two or three years haven't been the same. So um, it, it does leave a little bit of a sour taste <coughs> in the mouth. But I also think we have to ask questions about his qualifying form. Has it been good this season? If he's going against Leclerc next year, he's going to have to step that up. So I think there are probably a lot of frustrations in regards to the car and potentially behind the scenes. There's also a lot of stuff inside the car that he probably does need to fix between now and Absolutely. And, and, we, and we mentioned, as I was, I was going to mention the talking point of the, the calm not maybe up, up standard, but he's been consistently, I think, beaten by, by Russell near the, end, near the end of this season. And you're right, it's incredibly sad to see uh, that uh, what has been ultimately such a successful time with the team come to an end like this. Uh, I, I don't know, Chimbe, what, what are your thoughts on this? I don't know. I've seen that with Hamilton, especially in this sort of like Grand Effect Terra, his qualifying performances in general have not been up to the usual Lewis Hamilton standards. And But obviously the one place that Lewis is normally even, arguably even stronger at, I've, I know he's got the most number of pole positions and stuff, but I always felt that Lewis Hamilton's always been more of a race day driver. He's always been stronger, and especially on that front, especially reach since the twenty since twenty twenty since you know the, the later years of the Mercedes domination and into the grand effect, um, and he seems to probably just struggle putting really pushing to the the car to its proper limits, and it's been a consistent thing throughout the whole grand effect thing. Well, he hasn't trusted the car in no. many years. Throughout this season, last season, he's always had complaints about the car and the balance, and you still hear it, and that's why he has to retire. But then he's so been... I think if you're... But it's the case with every driver, right? Qualifying is about pushing the car to the limits. If he doesn't feel comfortable and confident in that car, he's not going to push yeah. it to its 100% limits in the same way that George is. Well, I, yeah, I don't know. But then it's, it's up to him. Like, surely he has, I, I guess, some... He has to be have some of the best experience on the grid and how to change the car up so that it does suit him and he, he should is. have knowledge of that so although yes it's not great when you aren't confident in the car i feel like that should be addressed a little bit it in a should way be. i think yeah. i do want to mention that it is this season sure he's been pretty poor against russell especially in qualifying but i found out today that going into abu dhabi for like as between George and Hamilton, Lewis and, sorry, Russell and Hamilton, <laughs> but throughout the three years they've been teammates, they are on exactly the same amount of points. So it's not like Lewis has been so very poor against Russell. He's just, they're on the same amount of points. It's just the season, the golfers, you can see it yeah. in qualifying, and I think that's where I the mean, concern is. Yeah, I think, I mean, the thing is, Russell, I think, has genuinely been the better qualifier out of the two. George is a, Rus- George is a qualifier. Well, he, is a, he is a Saturday oh, well, man. He well, is a Saturday man. He, w- he was at Williams. He was at Williams. Yeah. He was a Saturday well, man. Yeah, they, yeah, they don't, they didn't call, they don't call him Mr. They didn't call him Mr. Saturday for nothing. But like, you know, like, then we, I mean, Vegas is a fantastic example, but like, Lewis is just using his experience to the max. When he pushed, I think he started 10th. Started 10th and he finished and, second, and he finished which second. is exactly highlighting of ultimately your point because at, at, at the end of the day, it was Russell that got pole position and he was able to very, very successfully convert that into a win. Yeah. But then his teammates started P10 and he also got on the podium behind him to complete yeah. the Mercedes 1 2, which really just sums up what yeah. these two drivers are like. I think with Lewis, it's just, it's, it's definitely been more of a trust issue with the car because I still remember, like, you're going back to what, 2020, is it? 22 or 23 in him Im- was it 2022 in Imola you know when he famously you know well infamously you know qualified 17th and then st- spent the whole right race behind Gasly's rear wing you know so like he, I mean like he, I mean there's gonna be moments when you know even the best drivers don't have uh great weekends unless you're Max Verstappen but like you know 
it's but we've seen so many members brilliant brilliance i think i think when, i'm trying to think last year too was it last year in austin when he momentarily held the, the lead of that race even though mercedes was by far a lonely third place in terms of third fastest car and verstappen just kept like pushing and pushing and obviously unfortunately because max just had a much quicker car like lewis can hold it but the fact that he held that lead and even like the fact that he was the fastest car he's had so many moments even at silverstone i know that's the best track but still but then something this leads on to to our point what you were kind of briefly touching upon there Chimit, is even if he's not had the best car his his attitude and his determination to win has yeah. never has, has never escaped but this is something that i was really taken aback by with hamilton in, in this race because he asked to retire the car which to me seems really bad from hamilton like i know obviously his car is very bad but his, his car isn't great and he hasn't got to grips with the car and it's been an unlucky race for him sure but mm. Surely he's just got to keep going in that moment, especially when you think about how many people depend on him, especially in the team. He, he must be su such a role model for everyone in that team and to for the people back at the factory and also the people on the pit wall to see him not want to drive there anymore. Surely he shouldn't do that and he should j just at least stick out for those last few laps just for the team that ultimately he's been a, a huge part of and he should use his experience as a driver in other ways, not just on the track, but also in his attitude towards having a bad race and a bad run of form. Uh, it's just not a really good look, is it? Uh, it's like the, he is the, I know he's not probably now the marquee driver, but he has been like the franchise driver for Merck. This is, he's the person who's been flying the flag for them. And for him to say, oh, let's retire on this penultimate race, says a lot about his... Um, it's like feelings in the car he just doesn't feel connected with it at all I do hope he didn't mean it I do hope that was a case where like he was saying it just to like say try and say okay there's no point there's no chance let's save the engine or whatever I hope it's something like that rather than oh I've just given up entirely but I really hope he isn't like this next year because if he is Leclerc's going to eat him alive. He's got a huge fight ahead of him. I think even more so, I, I want to say, with Russell, because not not only is, is is Leclerc an incredible driver, but he is very established in that team, and I think he's he's on probably the best form, arguably, that he's ever been in the, in the past couple of seasons. I'm not too sure. He's certainly been on, on some great form and has a lot of confidence in that Ferrari car, and I think you'd argue that maybe his lack of success would be more down to the pace of the car and maybe mistakes from his team than actually what he's been able to deliver. And I think he's uh, he's still quite an underrated driver as well uh, in that Ferrari. And it's certainly going to be very difficult for him. We'll move it a bit lower down the grid uh, or a bit lower down the constructors to our sixth place battle that we're keeping a monitor in because there has been big changes or, or big effects from this race as Gazi was able to pick up an incredible fifth place. We mentioned before that he's been so great in this in the second half of the season, uh, picking up some some huge points for for Alpine, and they're now five points ahead of their rivals Haas for the battle in sixth. And surely this is the constructors' sixth place wrapped up. I don't know. What what are your thoughts on this? I I think it is. I think I said it last time I was on the pod. I did expect them to get. Sick. I think they've been on uh, their their form recently. Yes, you were right. Race. I did say has for sick, and it was not. It was not the There's right. There's still thing. a race to go. There's still uh, a I race to go. The, 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 the five points is a bit of an advantage to hold at this stage. Though. In sixth place, it's uh, for 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 teams that are fighting over the last few. Yeah, Abu yes, Dhabi doesn't right. usually produce some chaotic races. Yeah. That's no. that's <laughs> that is actually going to age like milk. But yes, it usually doesn't produce some chaotic races. So five points should be enough. We're saying this, but again, I, I wouldn't put it past Nico Hulkenberg. I'm never going to write that man off. He I, could produce a wonder. I think it's more Magnussen that I'm... He, he's, Magnussen has performed pretty well over the last few races as well, I've felt. It's, uh, I think yeah. it feel, it's felt a lot more even over the last five or six. I think also, the, I know we're not going to talk about it this episode, so keep your eye out for the Abu Dhabi review, but with Alpine being in such a disastrous state that they are currently with everything that's happened, the pressure maybe is on Gasly and maybe he just won't be able to form because the team morale will not be there. So maybe Alpine will have a massive shocker and has to be able to capitalise. Well, maybe we can tact maybe I can tactically predict 
has to do badly knowing that it's not going to happen because every prediction I make on this podcast is wrong and then they get sixth so we'll see I do also want to say though that even though I think the main advantage that Alpine got from this race was from Gasly I thought it was also quite a poor race from a very uncharacteristically poor race from Nico Hülkenberg Uh, he did get quite unlucky I think on the first lap incident which he was a bit of a passenger in and got that puncture which set him back from early on but then he did spin on one of the safety car restarts, uh, the same one that that uh, where Perez retired as well, and ultimately I think his uh, it, it's it's his points that have really have really dragged Haas up. I think this uh, Kevin Magnussen has also, also done very well, especially in the second half of the season. But Hulkenberg has played a huge role in that, and I think him not performing has really. Um, has really shown the effects in terms of, the, of, of on the Constructors' Championship, ultimately. Yeah, I think it has had a... Ma- like, his lack of performance recently has had a big effect on that Constructors' Championship. I think it was looking very... He was very comfortable at the start of the season, uh, Hulkenberg was, in terms of performances in the race and in qualifying. And now, because of his drop-off, as well as like, the improvement of the Alpines as well, I think that's also counterbalanced it. Uh, they haven't... It's not been as easy for them to gain, get points um, in the races and so that's had a massive effect on why Alpine have been able to make the surge back up through into sixth and I don't see this end I think it, uh, this will end with Alpine finishing sixth. Yeah certainly it's uh, it's Alpine do have a, a certain uh, good advantage over Haas now for the final race as we mentioned it's five points Alpine on 59 points and Haas on 54 but we never know it's it's Things can happen. It is an unpredictable sport, as we know, but it is certainly looking more and more dire for Haas. And Alpine have, I think, have done a very good job of uh, chain of, of securing the sixth place from what has ultimately been quite a disappointing season for them. And of course, we could not round off a review of the 2024 Qatar Grand Prix without mentioning that now Kick Sauber have got their first point of the season. Let's go they, uh, applause <laughs> round of applause. They've they've finally got together. Obviously, at the start of the season, their car was maybe alright, but their pit stops were god awful and then their car was even worse come the midpoint of the season but finally they've got some things together and a bit of luck as well and i think i'm very happy for for joe uh for for this to be his performance because we know he is going at the end of this season and likely will not have a uh, a seat for next season and is likely going to be spending some amount of time away from f1 but I think it's it's nice to have a, such a solid performance, uh, an incredible performance, really, in, in a car which is, has been an absolute boat for for this season. I wouldn't even call it a boat because a they, weren't even, they weren't even good in the wet, so it wasn't good. <laughs> but no, That's it, good is, point. it is great for Joe, I think. It's also a great role for the team. Bottas got 11th, and it was so close to getting that points finish, so that is a shame for him as well. Um, but I think... They, they've they've been such good teammates together. Sure, the team has been a bit been a bit of a dire state uh, since they've been in it. But it's kind of wholesome to see the final race together as teammates. The final race for both of them in the sport, to be honest, because we all agree that Joe isn't going to be able to come back. Uh, he just hasn't performed well enough throughout the three years. Bottas, I think it's unlikely he'll get another seat. He is going to be Mercedes. I believe it's not confirmed yet, but he is likely to be the Mercedes reserve driver. Um, or test driver, I can't remember which one. So he will stay within the realms of the sport, but yeah, it is, it's it's nice to see. It's good for them. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think we are going to see, but definitely, bo- I think bo- even both of these could be their final two races. Like whether Bias comes back after this would be something I'd question as well. And I know Guan Yu Zhou's as well, basically been earmarked as Ferrari reserve now, from what I remember. So they're both... It's not like they're both going to like step away from F1 completely. But I think, yeah, it's definitely nice for them to kind of go out on these races on like a high, you know, something that they will enjoy and that the team will enjoy. Because, I mean, they've already said going forward that, they're, that their team's already running into water. And when they're becoming Audi, like Binotto said, like their engines are going to be really bad when they start making them in 2026. So you know all sorts of problems yet to come but it's just nice to see them happy for once i just find it strange that they brought upgrades a race ago it's like they, they brought upgrades for this season despite being plumb last on in the constructors this will have, have no value in terms of financial gain in terms of bringing them upgrades i find it really morale, odd. morale can we uh, say that well, I don't think there's a lot of morale going around, in fairness, <laughs> that kick. It must feel horrible if you're 
part of that team. Um, but it, I just felt like it's funny that they've only now begun to, begun to be somewhat competitive in the midfield, and it's a bit too, it's a bit too little too late for any constructors games. So I found that very amusing. Maybe if the if the season was like thirty five races long, we would see Joe uh, uh, kick Salberg up to fifth. But I guess we'll never know. Um, but yeah, certainly. And I think it was. I think correct me if I'm wrong. But I think Joe Joe Granu's family was at the race watching him there, which is really nice for them to be able to see uh, him doing very well. And ultimately, in a race which did did contain a lot of controversial moments and a lot of moments that we probably hated, uh, it was nice to see that come out of the end of it. Uh, we've done a very good review of the Qatar Grand Prix and gone through a lot of the talking points. The only thing that remains, of course, is our predictions. And what we'll find is that from we've the all predictions... We've done awful. We've all done awful, but with the differences in that those levels of awfulness between us, that the championship between us is getting very, very close for the last race of the season. So, Jimmy, we'll pass on to you first. Uh, again, if, if you haven't seen our Abu Dhab, uh, sorry, our Qatar preview, uh, then what are you doing? You should definitely tune in next time. But we do predictions of the top five and uh, the, the top five drivers in the race and also a one, two, and three point prediction. Uh, the more points it's worth, the more unlikely it is. And, Chimmy, you had the first pick for the winner. So, if you wanted to read out your predictions first, how did you get on? So I predicted uh, Oscar Piastri to win it, uh, even though I'd, it was just more of a tactical thing because uh, I because especially with recent races just being everyone all over the place in a way. He says that now that it was tactical. Yes. After Piastri. No, but I, do uh, it. yeah. <laughs> I'm getting. <laughs> yeah. Okay, whatever, not getting the win. Whatever. Say yes. Whatever. Get third, but yeah, yeah. To give him more credit, but yes. Yeah. Uh, then I went Leclerc second, Verstappen third, Sainz fourth, Norris fifth. Again, just to be honest, it, it was just more of a random order. But then I was. That's the thing. Now we're all just predicting these yeah. random orders because no one knows what is going yeah. to happen. There isn't a singular Slack. dominant car. No. It makes it's a change a when it's we're a, all battling over thing. picking Verstappen. Oh, first. I enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you want to go through your one, two, and three point prediction, Chimmy? Did yes. you see if them happen? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> My one pointer did, I believe. I said there was no repeat driver on the podium where I said, like, the first, the winner of the sprint is not first in the race, that sort of thing. Okay, yeah, that was fine. So, obviously, we had Piastri winning the race and Verstappen winning, winning the main the race. race. So, yeah, that's and then fine. Norris was second, obviously, wasn't second. And then I believe who was third again? Uh, it was third in uh, for the sprint race. I think it was Leclerc. Uh, no, Russell, Russell, Russell sorry. And obviously, Russell. Piastri was third in the race. So. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that's absolutely fine. My Brit, uh, RB, I said RB to jump to seventh in the constructors. Well, obviously, they had a howler of a race. So They're looking a uh, very firm eighth at the moment. We haven't yes. obviously talked about them this episode, and, but yes. And uh, my three point of addiction, which Oscar, which <laughs> love, would, did, would love, was I said that neither Aston Martin made it Q2 in the qualifying. But obviously, and both of them did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. to, to Oscar's delight, they did do very well in, in qualifying. Um, but that means that you get six points, am I correct in saying, from that? Mm -hmm. Which takes you up to 141 in our predictions scoreline. Uh, I believe it is you to go next. You had second pick. And of course, we all know who you went for first place. It was Norris. What was your top five like and what were your so three, one, two, three points? he was doing really well until the FAA decided they didn't want him to do very well. So... Debatable. Not debatable. <laughs> she lifted, she? <laughs> De not debatable. We've um, talked about this already. So Norris first. I put Verstappen second. Uh, Piastri third, which was correct. I, that's the only one I got correct, and I'm kind of proud of that. Um, it was just a random double McLaren podium prediction, but alas, we move on. Uh, Leclerc in fourth, and Sainz in fifth. So I got five points from that, because Verstappen and Leclerc were both in the top five, so we'll take that. Uh, None of my one, two, three point predictions came true. None of them. Ah. So I predicted Lawson top 15 in quality. He just didn't perform. Lawson just hasn't been on form. So that was an oof. Um, Perez doesn't get out of Q1 was my two pointer. And so, okay, I'm not going to give myself the points because obviously we all know it was inferred for the main race and he got out of Q1 for the main race. But he didn't get out of Q1 for the sprint. 
No, you're not getting that. Oh, okay. I need I to keep. I, would try it. I need to keep this point tally <laughs> I need, I in need the prediction to... score. No, but you. If I think because I because specified. it wasn't specified, it was for it the main for race, the main... and this and carried against Q two. Yes, exactly. Why did he decide to be decent, Jesus? Um, and then the same top two for both qualifyings, which didn't happen, uh, sadly. So yeah, five points, which takes we... you up to one hundred and forty-five. So four points ahead of Chimmy. Yeah. Still very close. It was then myself for picking third, and I went with Sainz in P1. Uh, he finished, uh, where did he finish? He was in P6, so not yeah. uh, a, a point from that. Uh, Russell, what I said was P2, he did finish in P4, so I get one point for, for that. Uh, Leclerc in P3, he finished one place above in, in P2. Verstappen P4, he obviously won the race, and then Norris in fifth, and Norris because of obviously that penalty finished in P10. So that is just, uh, what's that? Three points for my top five. And then uh, my one point prediction was two drivers hit the gravel, tr the new gravel traps in the race. Uh, I'm pretty sure that did happen. Yeah, we had two drivers that spat out. Two, so... two drivers that spat out, so that was firmly did happen. Uh, I said that both Haas cars would beat both RBs and that did not happen because obviously uh, Hulkenberg uh, didn't finish the race. And so technically so, so I said that Sonoda and Lawson in 13th and 14th did finish ahead of him. And then I said that in, as my three point prediction, Ferrari would overtake McLaren in the constructors. And even though they have reduced that deficit, uh, Your delusion they, did not come true. The, the, the three point prediction, which ultimately you could say is a delusion, yes, did not come through. Come, come through. So that is, uh, that's Four points yeah. for for Would my. I say we ordered horrendously this week. It was not a good week, but then it was an unpredictable week, so that is fair enough. So I'm on 146. So that means that going into the last race of the season, Chimme is on 141, Catch is on 145, and then I am on 146. So fun fact: this isn't actually the closest title battle that we're seeing at the moment because in the F2 standings there is 0.5 of a point between. Uh, Bortoletto in first and Hajar in second. So just a little shout out to F2. They also have their final, their, alongside F1 Academy, they have their final race weekend. And 0.5 of a point in the title battle is crazy. Yeah. What? This is not the closest prediction battle that we've had either. Because <laughs> me and Kingswood, me or Kingswood was, I think, level on points. I think it was the last year or the year before going to Abu Dhabi. So. So we, we've certainly seen it before, but but we've certainly got a good one in store for now. So make sure to join us for our Abu Dhabi preview and review for the final race of what has been ultimately an incredible season uh, for 2024. The preview will obviously be coming out in a couple of days and the review coming out after the race has finished. But uh, until then, thank you very much, Catch, Anwar, Chimme and uh, Oscar for joining me. I've been your host, Callum, and until next time, goodbye. <laughs>